Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our viewers joining our weekly Ask WHO sessions on COVID-19 situation. Morning, Apologize for that. <laughs> um, today, uh, actually this week, we, we changed the timing from Tuesday to Thursday because Dr. Mike Ryan is away on an important duty travel with Director General in Qatar, but also Maria was away um, traveling in, in a few countries, actually. Um, so Maria, maybe we can start with an update uh, from your missions, um, how are the, the different countries doing when it comes to COVID and for your missions about COVID-19? Thanks, Alex. Um, yes, I, I was on duty travel uh, for the last couple of weeks and it's um, really my one of my first times away in a couple of years. And just like all of you um, have been really craving to travel for work and see the people who we work with. Um, I was in three different countries. I was in, uh, I went to Manila in the Philippines. Um, I was in Phnom Penh in Cambodia, and I've just come back overnight from uh, Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. Um, and these were missions to largely meet with our teams in the Western Pacific Country Office and meet all of the teams that are working on COVID-19 um, from the region and also the member states of that region, and really just to discuss where they are um, and how we move forward um, with COVID-19 what we do in this third year of this mm -hmm. pandemic and how we adjust and strengthen um, the strategy for COVID and mm -hmm. for the future. And it was so wonderful to meet uh, colleagues out there. I would met so many virtually, but not in person. Mm -hmm. So that was really special. Um, in Cambodia, um, I used to live in Cambodia um, between 2006 and 2008, where I was doing my PhD on avian influenza. Mm -hmm. And I have such a fondness for the country. So I went to visit our country office and meet with partners. Um, in the, the country who are working on zoonoses, so these pathogens that, that pass between uh, animals and humans, and looking at how we strengthen the One Health approach, this comprehensive approach about animals and humans and the environment in which we live and work. Um, and it was also fantastic to be back there. Um, some of my fondest memories of research are in Cambodia with the Cambodian people who are just fantastic. Um, and then I was just in Dubai for the World Government Summit. Um, where I was on a panel with uh, ministers from UAE, from Greece, and from uh, the Seychelles, speaking about, again, you know, where are we and are we off track on some of the triple billion and, and you know, and dealing with all of these other uh, challenges that everyone faces, um, and where do we go from here with COVID-19? So it was just fantastic to see people mm -hmm. and to be with people um, and to really see how different countries are, are staying vigilant for COVID-19, but really getting on with, with their lives. And, and it's really nice to see that balance uh, between fighting this virus because it's still not over, this pandemic is not mm -hmm. over, um, but you know, trying to work it out. Thank you, Maria. And I'm uh, glad you, you had some good experiences and um, meeting the colleagues and actually uh, experts on the ground who are fighting this pandemic uh, beyond WHO. Um, maybe we can start as usual with epidemiological update. And um, you mentioned you were in our Western Pacific office and we know that some countries in the region are actually having surge of cases. So maybe we can start with Wipro and you can walk us through the world and what's the situation? Sure. So it, it still remains quite dynamic. Um, in Wipro, um, the Western Pacific region, uh, which is in, in uh, Asia and the Pacific, many Pacific islands, um, they saw a decrease in cases uh, in the last seven days and a decrease in deaths. Um, but there are still some countries that are really facing some surges. Um, and what we do see consistently in Wipro, um, as well as in all regions of the world, this decoupling, as you've heard us say, between mm -hmm. infections and deaths. So even in countries that have passed their peak or are still seeing an increase in Omicron, and Omicron, the variant of concern, which includes BA.1 and BA.2. I want to remind everyone out there that BA.2 is already a variant of concern um, and is part of Omicron. Um, people who are vaccinated um, are uh, much well protected against severe disease and death. And this is consistent across all countries. If we look at other parts of the world, um, all regions of the world report a decline in incidents in, in new cases in the last seven days. But this is with the backdrop of a significant decline in testing. So we are concerned about these trends and making sure that they're real. So it's possible that, that, that we're missing a, a large number of cases because Omicron is so much more transmissible um, than any variant we have seen so far. And among the sublineages, BA.2 is the most transmissible virus we've seen yet. 
For deaths, um, we saw overall at a global level an increase again in deaths. But again, there is some differences in reporting of deaths in two of our regions, in the Americas and in Southeast Asia, with some correction factors that they have. So, um, you know, we don't want to see any increase in deaths. Um, but we are concerned that these deaths are largely happening among people who are not vaccinated, um, who have not received any doses of vaccine, or who are in those uh, vulnerable groups, at-risk groups, people with underlying conditions, people of older age that haven't received the third mm -hmm. dose of their primary series. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's very, very concerning uh, the third year on, given that we have safe and effective mm -hmm. vaccines, including against Omicron. So quite dynamic um, around the world. Pandemic is not over, unfortunately. Um, we still need to uh, use the tools to save lives now, not later, now. Uh, and this starts with vaccines and making sure that we have equitable access to that. But we also need to drive the spread down. We need to drive down the spread because we had more than uh, 10 million cases reported again last week. Uh, and that's a drop in the bucket uh, in terms of how many we think are out there. So with that level of intensity of spread, uh, we will still continue to see virus evolution and future variant emergence. Thank you so much, Maria. We, we, we have one follow-up question coming from Ayakumar Padamanabha Pillai. Uh, how the Omicron variant has affected people, if we can compare, basically the question is if there is a difference uh, in um, how people with two doses and booster doses are affected. Uh, you already mentioned that um, unvaccinated are at the highest risk of severe disease and including that. Uh, but do we see and do we have any any data showing the difference between the regular two doses and those who receive the third dose? We do, particularly among the older age groups. Um, and what if you look at the recommendations from WHO, um, making sure that that everyone out there has their first and second dose. Um, but that third dose in the primary mm -hmm. series for older age groups above 60, above 70, above 80, and people with underlying conditions, this is really important uh, because we do see better protection mm -hmm. um, there. And that is, as I said, among particularly among the at-risk groups, immunocompromised individuals, people with underlying medical conditions, and people over the age of 60. Um, and so the data is coming in. Uh, we mm -hmm. still don't have mm -hmm. all of the information about this virus, all of the information mm -hmm. about the vaccines, but there's a very good system that's out there that's looking at vaccine effectiveness mm -hmm. um, and looking at how the vaccines are actually performing mm -hmm. in people. And, and this is a system that needs to be maintained um, because, again, as the virus continues to circulate, we need to be able to monitor not only the changes in the virus and the virus evolution, but also how our mm -hmm. countermeasures are working therapeutics, diagnostics, mm -hmm. and vaccines. And this remains really critical. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, we are having a question coming from Alessandro watching us on LinkedIn. What about previous immunity with previous variants against protection on complications caused by Omicron? I think vaccine helped us a lot, but we should not ignore natural immunity for accurate new policy. What do you think? Absolutely correct. Um, what we look at as we look to the future as we look at the variants that are circulating and whether these are variants of concern. The latest is Omicron. It will unfortunately not be the last, but this is in the context of increasing population level immunity. And that's from both infection with this virus um, and vaccination. And so we look at both. Um, there are quite literally thousands of seroprevalence studies um, that have been published or in preprint form that look at what is the level of antibodies um, most of those studies were done when we hadn't had vaccines introduced mm -hmm. yet. Um, and as you know, in many parts of Africa, vaccination coverage is very low. So we look at both. Um, so that question is absolutely correct. And again, what we're looking at is um, past infection. We're looking at vaccines, vaccines used, how many doses. And we're looking at how this antibody response um, main is maintained over time. What we can say is that the vaccines uh, and previous infection do provide an antibody response and a complex antibody response at many parts of the, the immune system. Um, and it's holding up very well in terms of protecting against severe disease and death. What we have to consider when we think of the spread, um, and some people have asked, why not just let people get infected? Um, what we worry about with that in letting the virus spread is not only the emergence of variants, but we worry about long COVID post-COVID-19 condition, um, where we 
uh, expect anywhere from you know, two to three per 10 people may have long-term effects following infection. We're just really learning about this. And so we can't let this virus spread. And especially when we have so many tools that are effective at reducing the spread and also saving lives. Thank you, Maria. We're getting so many good follow-up questions. One is from Margaret, also watching us on uh, LinkedIn. Um, you mentioned long COVID. So she's asking if those diagnosed with long COVID or post-COVID condition, how we call it, are at higher risk of reinfection. Um, I don't know about reinfection. I mean, we do know that people can be reinfected, um, you know, following a period of time. Um, this is most often captured through sequencing. So we can look at the first infection and that virus is sequenced in the second infection. Um, and we, we have reports of people who have been in, infected more than one time, particularly with different variants of concern that are circulating. We have to reflect that it's the third year. Um, it's not like this was an outbreak that lasted six weeks or even six months. Um, and again, with the virus circulating at such an intense level, and especially in the context of the lifting of public health and social measures, um, and the fact that vaccines, while they're incredibly protective against preventing severe disease and death, they don't prevent all infections or onward transmission. This virus will continue to infect people. So that's, this is why WHO is asking all people and all governments to have policies that remain cautious, mm -hmm. that are agile, you know, that use the tools, masking, distancing, improving and investing in ventilation. Um, none of this is different from what we've been saying since the beginning. Avoid crowds, work from home if you're unwell, strong surveillance, good testing, good sequencing. Um, we will continue to kind of hammer these messages because these are the tools that are needed to end the emergency of COVID-19 to really take the death and disease out of this. But again, with the virus circulating at such intense levels, um, there remains the risk of people getting infected again following a certain period of time. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, here's the next question co uh, coming, sorry, from Jacqueline Cassis watching us on Facebook. Can you predict virus mutations? I wish we could. Um, we wish we could. Um, what we can say uh, with certainty is that the virus will continue to evolve. This is a natural process of these viruses. Um, and this is something that we have expected, which is why we, we've set up a virus evolution working group, which has now been formalized into a technical advisory group for virus evolution to assess the changes. Um, there are many extremely smart people around the world that are looking to see if we can predict, if we can anticipate, and maybe anticipate is a better word, um, changes in the spike protein, different parts of the virus itself. Um, we can make some educated guesses, but there's a lot of uncertainty around virus evolution. Mm -hmm. um, we look at different characteristics. Will the virus with the different mutations become more transmissible? Um, will the virus become more severe? Will the virus become less severe? Will there be more what we call immune evasion, which means that our uh, vaccines um, are not as effective as before? And we don't know for certainty what the next variant will be. There are a lot of people that are out there that are saying, this is what will happen. We don't know. And this is why we have to plan for all potential futures. Um, we can say that the Omicron variant of concern will not be the last, uh, but we cannot say for certain whether the next one will be more or less severe. Thank you, Maria. Um, here's a question from Colin watching us on LinkedIn. What would your advice be for people who are immunocompromised and as countries are lifting COVID-related restrictions such as mask mandates? So the first thing is to get vaccinated uh, when you can. Um, we know that uh, vaccines are incredibly protective at preventing hospitalization, um, needing intensive care, and protecting against death uh, from COVID-19, including the latest variant of concern. So get vaccinated um, and make sure you receive the full doses that are recommended for you where you live. We also need to ensure um, that immunocompromised patients, and this covers a lot of different types of conditions, um, that they receive the, the care that they need and the treatments that they need for their own conditions. We know that the COVID-19 has disrupted many essential health services, has disrupt, disrupted um, cancer treatments, um, HIV, access to HIV treatments. And so we need to ensure that you receive the care that you need for what you are dealing with beyond COVID-19. 
But we are also asking not just you um, to be cautious and wear a mask and keep your distance, um, but also others who are around you. Uh, wearing a mask these days is quite a simple thing to do. Masks mm -hmm. are widely available. And even on my trips, I was really amazed at how high um, the coverage was. Everybody was wearing a mask. Everybody was wearing it properly over their nose and mouth um, and getting on with their lives. Uh, and, and masks are readily available. We, they were not available in the beginning of this pandemic, but they are now. So you should continue to wear a mask, especially when you're around others um, and people who come in contact with you. Uh, make sure they're vaccinated as well. Um, but be cautious. You know, use your, your gut. And if you, you know, if you are going out and about, do what you can um, to keep yourself safe. But also uh, the people who are around you should also be safe. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, here is a question from Minat Niyan uh, asking, uh, what are the best scenarios or potential timeline of the global pandemic in this third year? And I maybe want to bring in here that WHO yesterday published its third strategic preparedness, readiness and response plan for COVID-19. We hope this one would be the last one um, that actually outlines the three potential scenarios for the trajectory of this pandemic. So maybe you can elaborate on those scenarios. I can. So yes, we did uh, issue uh, our latest strategic preparedness and response plan for COVID-19. Um, and this is the third plan that WHO has outlined. And this is a plan for the world. Uh, it's WHO's plan, but it's also our partner plan and the plan for member states. And our goal with issuing this plan is to end the emergency of COVID-19. Um, and so when we think how we do that, we look at what may happen and we use these planning scenarios. Um, scenarios are only good if you use them to plan and to prepare. And so what we have are three planning scenarios. We have one where we call it a base case, which is basically our working scenario. Based on everything we know about this virus, um, that the virus, you know, the base scenario is that the virus will continue to evolve. Um, we do expect to see a reduction in severity because population level immunity is increasing. And that's from infection, past infection, but also increasing vaccination. And that's a good thing. Um, we do expect to see some seasonality with this virus. It's a respiratory pathogen in the temperate regions of the world, not the tropics, because they don't quite see that, uh, that seasonality. Um, and this is largely driven by behavior of individuals and where they spend their time. Um, but we do expect to see within this scenario um, a potential waning of immunity over time and needing of additional doses or booster doses for vulnerable populations, people that wear uh, you know, underlying conditions over 60. And within this scenario, we expect to see outbreaks among people who are not mm. protected uh, and where public health and social measures are lifted. That's our base case. Our best case scenario as we see future variants. Um, so virus continues to evolve, but future variants are less severe and we have a very strong population level immunity that is maintained. And therefore we don't need more vaccines. We also have a worst case scenario uh, where we have a more transmissible virus and a more virulent, a more severe um, virus with immune escape um, and we do see that um, our vaccines are less effective. Um, so those are the different types of scenarios that we think through and we need to plan for. We have a fourth uh, scenario, which, which we are considering, which is different. It's called a reset, which is essentially there's so much change in the virus itself that we essentially start over. Now, that's something we have to think about. We're not saying that to scare anybody, but that as planners, we have to think about that. And in fact, if you look at the strategic preparedness response plan, there's a third section, not there's the sections of how we get out of the current pandemic, but also thinking for the future, because everything that we are doing right now for COVID-19 lays a foundation for the future and to deal with not only this virus, but any future virus that we face. And this is really critical because right now you heard me say in the beginning that some countries are reducing their testing. We're seeing some countries completely lift the use of public health and social measures. We're seeing countries dismantle their surveillance systems, their workforce uh, mm -hmm. for contact tracing, um, reducing their investments in personal protective equipment. Um, and this is not what we want to see in the third year of this pandemic. We want to see uh, an enhancement 
of this and a strengthening of this, um, and particularly sequencing, so that we not only have good surveillance, good testing, but good sequencing so we can track this virus and its variants. So what the strategic preparedness and response plan outlines is an adjustment into this third year, recognizing that the world is facing massive challenges um, due to public health reasons, but also many other conflicts around the world. And how do you use all of the different pillars of the response to end uh, the mm. emergency of this pandemic? We're, the virus will be with us uh, for a long time. Um, our ability to eradicate or eliminate uh, is gone, mm. um, but we need to really focus on ending this acute phase. And there's five elements that are outlined there. We, everyone is welcome to read this. Um, but this is what we use to work with partners and to work with member states and adjusting their national strategies mm -hmm. um, as we move forward. Thank you so much, Maria. And that was really great update. And you're actually receiving some positive feedback. Wonderful. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. And we're having quite a lot of more questions coming in. So I'm, I'm grateful to our viewers. Um, for those who just joined, we, we have Dr. Maria Van Kerko with us uh, providing the latest update on the COVID-19 situation. Um, if you're watching us on Twitter, you can use the hashtag AskWHO. On other platforms, use the comment section. Um, Maria, here is um, a question from Dorothy watching us on LinkedIn. Is the incidence of long COVID affected by different variants? Well, we don't have a lot of information on uh, uh, long COVID following the waves of Omicron. It's still a little early. Uh, we have a definition of post-COVID-19 condition or long COVID, which um, starts three months after um, the infection, after the disease. Um, and that doesn't mean that you know people aren't having longer term effects earlier or they start earlier, um, but we have a definition and we have to start with a definition so we know what we're, we're talking about, but we're really just learning about this. There's no reason to suspect that we would have uh, less um, experience with long COVID following the Omicron wave compared to the previous uh, waves of infection mm -hmm. from alpha, beta, the ancestral strain, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and now Omicron. Um, and this is something I should have said in any of the planning scenarios, long COVID is part of any of the future trajectories of this pandemic and countries need to plan. Um, there's some really incredible um, studies that are coming out that are looking at cardiac conditions, looking at um, uh, impacts on the brain, uh, mental health, um, ability to uh, exercise. You know, we're really still just learning about mm -hmm. this. And this is something WHO is deeply concerned about. Mm -hmm. And we're working with clinicians, um, patient groups, uh, survivors, uh, long COVID uh, groups around the world from adults and children about how we can help with recognition, with research, with rehab, with proper care. Um, and so this is a long-term investment that needs to be in place, um, regardless of how this uh, virus continues to circulate. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, here is a question, as, as you just said, uh, that countries need to be prepared to provide support to uh, post-COVID condition patients. And this is exactly the question that Jessica asked, uh, also watching us on LinkedIn. What is the, the least a country's health system can do to handle the oncoming flood of chronic disease resulting from long COVID? So we, through our clinical uh, team, uh, led by Dr. Janet Diaz, are working with clinicians all over the world um, and experts all over the world to have a better clinical care pathway for COVID-19. Um, and what this means is whenever a patient shows up at a healthcare facility, uh, whether it's early on, even before, you know, to, to deal with prevention, um, all the way through early disease, late disease, post-COVID-19 uh, condition, to get into that clinical care pathway and receive the care that they need. We have clinical guidance uh, that is out um, and it's, it's, been up, it's updated regularly. We're constantly looking at new therapeutics and we're looking at how uh, the complexity of the disease um, and the long-term effects could be dealt with more comprehensively. Um, so we call this our clinical care pathway. Um, and we're working with governments to ensure that patients uh, can enter that pathway as early as possible and receive the care they need based on the conditions that they have from COVID, but also the other conditions that they may be dealing with. 
Thank you so much. Um, here is a very good question from Karen Nord watching us on Facebook. Uh, with Omicron BA.2 variant, subvariant out there, would it be possible for another variant that is being missed because uh, at home tests aren't picking it up? So we have a global system. Um, WHO is working with our member states, uh, public health professionals, uh, researchers, uh, academics, experts, um, to make sure that there's strong surveillance for this virus, for COVID-19. Um, and we need to ensure that that continues. Um, part of that surveillance system is testing, uh, making sure that we have good PCR tests, and that has greatly expanded around the world at national and subnational levels in every country. It's really quite incredible. Um, we now have many countries that are using self-tests, these rapid antigen-based tests, and those are not always captured within the surveillance systems. It is important that governments understand um, their use, self-testing use, and also understand the results from those so that they can monitor trends as well and also advise patients and people on the care that they need. Um, part of the tracking, uh, it's not just the tests themselves, but it's the sequencing. And what we have out is guidance that looks at not just more sequencing, but intelligent sequencing, we call it, um, and better geographic representation so that we can track this virus around the world, not just in high income countries, not just in Europe and in North America, but across all of the different con continents around the world. Um, and so it's really important that that continues. We do expect um, that there will be more variants and our TAG VE, the Technical Advisory Group for Virus Evolution meets regularly. And we have presentations from, um, from molecular epidemiologists, clinicians, uh, virologists regularly that present to us, you know, here are some of the things that we're looking at. We've, we've seen a recombinant or we've seen a variant or we've seen something that may be unusual. And they discuss, what does that mean? What is the public health importance of that? Um, and do we need to adjust anything related to our strategy or the vaccine composition? So there's a very good system that is in place, um, but we are concerned with a reduction in testing and a reduction in sequencing. Um, this is compromising our ability to track this virus. So again, uh, we're working with member states to ensure that that is um, strengthened. We've just published a 10-year uh, genomic sequencing strategy, which is, which is literally about enhancing what has been put in place and, and making the long-term investment in regional approaches um, and making sure countries have a robust system for sequencing that is sustainable, not just for the latest virus, but is really out there to detect epidemic and pandemic pathogens. So again, we're thinking, what do we do now for COVID-19 to end the current situation, but how do we sustain this for all future epidemic and pandemic potential uh, pathogens? Thank you so much, Maria. Um, another interesting question coming from Syed Iftikar Ahmed saying, Maria, do you think now our immune system can face a new weak variants without vaccination? The short answer is, uh, I don't know. Um, we will have to see what the next variant emerges. What are the characteristics of the next variant? It is certainly possible that we could have variants that are less severe and that our immune response that we've had from either past infection or vaccination holds up really robustly. Um, you know, that's one of the, the scenarios that we're, that we're looking at. Um, but it could also be the other way around. So that's why we have to plan for, for any uh, eventuality. And this is why we're asking people to be cautious uh, and not just focus on the, the vaccine side of that equation, but also take steps to reduce the spread because we have to balance um, the approach while also getting back to our lives and living responsibly with this virus. I really have a problem with the phrase living with COVID, living with this virus, because many have used it as a, as a signal to give up and that there's nothing more to do. But we are living with this virus and this virus is with us, but we need to live with it responsibly. You know, 50,000 people dying every week, 50, 60, 70 that we know of, is not managing COVID-19. It is unacceptable because we have tools that can save lives now. So we need to get this right. We can do this. I think part of the reason I wanted to travel was to kind of get out there and see and talk to people. And I'm, I'm more inspired than I ever have been um, because we can do this. The director general talks about this all the time. He lays out the plans of how we can do this. 
WHO will be here every step of the way, uh, working with member states and working with all people. Um, but we can do this. We just really need to maintain the vigilance on this and, and figure it out together. Uh, thank you, Maria. And then just in follow-up to, to what you just said, we have a question from a viewer. What's the point of preventative measures when our government is saying to go and to go to work despite being infected with COVID? Well, as I said, we need to not only um, use tools that save lives now, we also need to take steps to reduce the spread. Um, this virus circulating at such an intense level um, raises the risk of more variants. Um, we are worried as an organization with our partner organizations, FAO and OIE, about the potential for new animal reservoir, the potential for the virus to go into animals and then spill back into people. We can have recombinants, we can have, there are a lot of scary things that could happen. So what we want to do is to empower everyone that's out there. You know, Mike says all the time, pandemics, epidemics, outbreaks begin and end in communities. And that is absolutely true. And as an organization, we want to keep you and your loved ones safe. And when we know there are tools that are work, we will fight to ensure that you have the information that you have, that governments have the information to have. And it is really important that if you are infected, um, that you are supported to, to work from home um, and you get the care that you need, first and foremost, that you get the care that you need. And you take measures, you know, to keep your loved ones who are right around you safe, wearing of a mask, distancing if you can, improving the ventilation where you live, you work, you study. It's as simple as opening the windows and having good cross ventilation, um, you know, avoiding crowds. And I know it's easier said than done to stay home if you're sick, um, but it really does have an impact um, on the potential spread. So we are continuing to recommend this and continuing to recommend the use of masks, um, distancing, hand hygiene, etc. Thank you, Marianne. Some uh, viewers were asking why you and I are not wearing a mask, and this is exactly because we are in a ventilated room and we have like here, I think, good two meters apart from each other. Um, so this is the reason, and we are the only two people in this room. We are not in a crowded space, so this is why we don't wear masks at the moment. But as we leave this room and walk around the building, we will do so. And when um, we're around others, and and through my entire travel, we had a mask on, and when exactly. We, you know, so there's there's places and times where, where it's best used and, and we're also trying to keep safe as well. Thank you. And you mentioned what is important and what WHO is very working on is to ensure equitable access to all the tools that okay. you elaborated we have. And we're, maybe this can be our last question for today. Does vaccine equity still matter at the current stage of the pandemic? Or is there any additional element that we should be more concerned about? The question is coming from Minat Ningyan. Uh, we had already a question from the same person earlier. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's more important than ever uh, to ensure equ equitable access to life-saving tools, uh, including vaccines. Um, there are far too many, 58% of people uh, have completed um, primary vaccination, but only 11% in low-income countries. Um, there are billions of people who have not even received their first dose. And this is unacceptable um, when we know that COVID-19 vaccines save lives. Uh, vaccine equity uh, and access to life-saving tool is the foundation, um, you know, about how we, how we look at any future threats going forward. So it's a great question and it remains critically important to us at WHO and our Director General and all of our partners across COVAX um, and it should be important to every single person out there. As was discussed yesterday in the press conference as well, and uh, as we are lucky to live in a country where we have access to even third dose, some countries are starting the fourth dose. There are plenty of people who didn't even have the first dose uh, and are exposed to the virus every day, like health workers. So we need to value every life around the world equally and, and provide that access. So That's right. Thank you so much, Maria, for your time today. We know you've traveled a lot, so you're also tired mm -hmm. and we need you um, to keep up with the great work. I'm also grateful to all our viewers from Belgium, Mexico, Nigeria, El Salvador, Iran, Germany, Italy, Uganda, India, Cameroon, Chad, Rwanda, Morocco, Ireland, France, and many others. Uh, thank you so much for your questions today. And uh, thank you for following us. Thank you for fo following our advice. As Maria mentioned, we can't give up. We need to keep up with the measures, getting vaccinated in the first place, or maybe 
help someone to get vaccinated. There are many ways we can do that. Keep wearing a mask, assessing the risk, avoid crowding pl crowded places, open windows, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you so much. And until next week, please stay safe.